Welcome back to the Lantern Rouge Cycling Podcast with Benji Nyson. One of the craziest days of cycling I've watched, maybe since the Planche de Belfi Stage 20 ITT last year, and compounded with that excitement, my internet just went down at two in the morning, so we've had a one-hour delay. That's why the pod might be getting to your ears a little bit late. It's my fault. Don't blame Benji. Just come at me on Twitter. Before we get into Paranis Stage 8 recap, and Terreno Adriatico Stage 5 recap. I want to give a big shout out to our show partner, LaCole. They make this podcast possible and for Benji to fit it in around all the other things he's doing, Mandalorian stuff. I don't know if he runs a blog about that or not. Maybe he should. LaCole produced performance cycling apparel. You can check them out at www.lecol.cc and they kid out Drops LaCole partnered by Tempur Continental Cycling Team, who you'll have seen at the Healthy Aging Tour this week, looking, I'd say, not even arguable, it's inarguable that they had the best kit in that race compared to all the other kits, that light blue or if it's turquoise, I'm not quite sure. I'm not uh, a specialist in that regard. We also have a Ko-Fi link now down below. Some people have been demanding that we put it in there for people that want to support the podcast a little bit differently also helps with the photo licensing which we hadn't budgeted for but i think we decided it adds a lot of value to the podcast but the easiest way you can support the podcast is word of mouth recommendations liking it down below or disagreeing and arguing with us in the youtube comments but enough of that paranese stage eight will do first this is a going to be a crazy recap 90 kilometer stage, three category, well, three climbs really, four Ks at 3%, 4% Cote de Duranus. Not a particularly terrifying climb, but technical descents. Roglic crashed at 20 Ks into the stage. I saw on race radio, or t- and but there was no live images at that stage. We saw photos of teammates pacing him back on. A break struggled to form after 30 Ks of riding, and then eventually there was one with Ruch de Klerk, Bistrom turns, and Co. They were joined by other riders later. Jumbo, Visma, and Bora were pacing them at 36 seconds. All was well. Roglic's 52 second lead on GC looked fine over Sharkman, but then it all turned to shit with 25 Ks to go. Benji, what was the first signs of distress for Roglic? Yes, we had on the screen suddenly an image of Roglic being 30 meters behind the Peloton group, riding at the head of a second group with Demar behind him and a few teammates of Demar. So something happened in this end. Now, it's been a few minutes since the race ended, so we've got a rough idea of what happened, which is good. We can get into detail now. So your internet falling out gave us a bit more knowledge about what happened. So I guess it's a, a low-key advantage indeed. And in that descent, we had Jumbo that was relatively at the front of the peloton, Roglic as well in that group. And... Apparently, according to Kreisweg, who said it after the stage ended, and also according to La Flamme Rouge, who investigated it intelligently on Twitter, definitely check out their threads and their Twitter, shout out for them there. Well, he crashed in the last corner of the descent with a good 30 kilometers to go. And what's interesting there is that it looked like perhaps he was in the wheels of the Umbo Riders, because the image we saw was him pacing alone in a second group to the peloton group. A peloton entirely stretched out because somebody was pacing at the front of the race. We didn't know who yet. And in that second group, he was alone. No teammates. Three Yumbo teammates in the peloton ahead of him. We see Bennett slowly but surely looking around in the first group and moving back. It takes a good two, three minutes for the Yumbo people ahead to realize what's going on and help Roglic. That's a lot of time you lose when it comes to pacing. Luckily for Roglic, the Mar was there with a few teammates. Those teammates did help out. I'm not sure whether they wanted to help out Roglic or Demar. I think you thought they wanted to help Demar. No, Roglic, right? Well, I thought Demar was pretty much out of the stage and they were just offering a cursory bit of help to Roglic because the gap was only 30 metres. It was barely anything. It looked like a regulation. It's the same sort of gap when they go to get a bid on Benji and then come back or just talk to the team car. It really wasn't far. We're talking three to four seconds, that gap. And I think FDJ were just like, oh, well, we'll pace him back on. But then the group 
in France started speeding up a lot. And I don't know what was happening with race radio. I don't know whether there was whether Yumbo Visma were complacent in not dropping riders out. I think it's more likely that they didn't know what was happening. Although, to be honest, that's not really an excuse because normally you have you watch Ineos and in, and Yumbo Visma last year. You should have your last domestique on the back wheel of Roglic, um, so that they know if they've dropped back. So they're really you don't shouldn't need race radio to know that he's in the second group. So I don't know what happened there. But then he wasn't able to close that gap, Benji, and that DeMar, FTJ, Roglic group kept thinning out. And who did you see pacing on the front on the peloton? We saw that Boro was moving up, but Hans Grohe was setting a few riders up there. Shockman obviously being very close on GC. I think, I don't know what the gap was, but 52. close enough to definitely have interest in opening up the gap. Okay, 52 seconds on Roglic. So interesting to open up that gap to Roglic more. He had, I think, three or four teammates, but the likes of a Nils Paul, it's so a massive engine there. We also saw that Astana at a certain point moved in because Bora was like, okay, I'm closing GC. Flazov and Izigero are pretty close as well. So why don't you ride? And Astana decided to help out then. So those two teams were the main engines behind the people that were trying to get the peloton as far away from they Roglic as possible. They dropped riders out of the break, Astana. Who was suffering... Yeah, I think uh, like multiple riders even, right? Two riders? Yeah. The thing about this is that, well, we'll go into the details of whether we like that they pace away from a rider who crashed or not after the stage. We'll talk about the stage first and then we'll go into our opinions on it and our takes on it. I think a lot of people have a lot of opinions for it, but yeah, we'll take that afterwards. First, the stage. So the Roglic group behind, he had his teammates there. One by one, those teammates went off the front of that group. And eventually he just ended up alone because they dropped a lot of people in the process, but they weren't getting too much closer because those are individual riders like Bennett and well, so Neil forth. Spollett against Stephen against Kreuzfeig Neil Spollett. on a false slide downhill. Yeah, that, that's just, it's just impossible to do that. And he obviously got a bit of help by some other people. I think Nasser Buhani was helping him out at a certain point. Tim the Cleric was helping him out at a certain point, but that's not going to get him too much further because those people are coming from the front. They're not exactly helping a teammate, so they're not going to go full. Tim the Cleric almost rode together with Roglic and Ravine. That gave me a heart attack, basically. Like, Tim the Cleric was taking a corner very wide. Roglic followed his wheel because he was helping him out a bit. And they almost both rode straight into, <laughs> into a section there. So I'm glad that didn't happen. I'm glad... They were able to break on time. I think Roglic lost the cleric at that point as well because the cleric was breaking much harder and was next to the road because of that. So Roglic, yeah, it, it was kind of done the moment that Roglic was alone and didn't have his teammates because the gap started going up from 20 to like 34 seconds in a matter of a minute. And then afterwards, it, it was slowly but surely moving up. And actually, I'm saying slowly but surely, but it was moving up quite rapidly at the time. So yeah, that's not... Not good for Roglic, GC over, and basically in the situation because of a crash that happened on the last descent, which is very unfortunate to lose Paris-Nice like that. But in the front group, plenty of people who are still willing to win the stage, of course. We've got Laporte, who is a sprinter. We've got a Magnus called Nilsson with a sprinter. We've got Astana, who still perhaps wants to put some some difficulty into Shockman because Shockman at this moment is virtual GC leader. Astana is just behind that with with Vlasov and Izagire. So if they could try and do something, those two riders against Shockman, it could play out. But yeah, what did Astana do to try and smash into Shockman a tiny bit there? Well, once Bora had pulled that gap out with Kofidis Hell pacing for Laporte to a solid gap of about 120, you know, Astana and Bora, they're all working together fine. They're like, let's knock Roglic off and then we can start to fight amongst ourselves. And this is all happening in the last 18 kilometers which is insane and they knew Roglic was done on GC once it hit about 130 and he looked he was gassed and no one was there to help him so at that point Astana started launching one twos first with Yoni Zagire trying to follow a move of oh I feel like it was a stage win hopeful maybe like a Dylan Turns Benji someone like that 
Izagira tried to follow him, and then it was uh, Vlasov. Then once Sharkman had brought back Izagira, countering over the top, but Sharkman was he was isolated at this point in the last eight kilometers or so, because his teammate had just his teams had just ridden full to try and increase that gap to Roglic. And Sharkman was so strong defending that position. He was in the virtual yellow jersey at that point by a long way, by over a minute in the last 10 Ks. And he closed down the Izagiri of Lasov, no worries. And then Astana were pretty much done. They weren't able to roll one twos against him. And then it's like a it's a pretty quick run into the finish, really twisty. And I think Astana's plans got ruined by all the stage hopefuls, Benji. So, yeah, who were the, the guys coming to the front of the group for the final sprint, which was like a twisty, fast run-in with a corner in the last 200 metres, so positioning was crucial. But, yeah, a few notable names up there. Yeah, Laporte and Court were the names we mentioned earlier that were the sprinters in the group, but a lot of others were also interested in trying something. Meta came to the front for a tiny bit, yeah. but it was more turns that they were trying to set up for that final section. You just had Lampard in there. He was also trying to get a bit of a proper position because he's done decent sprints in the past. He hasn't properly won one at all or near that, but he can top five a sprint like that. And in a situation like this after a stage like today, everything's possible. So everybody worming his way to the front. But I feel like this final kilometer was really sketchy. I think that a lot yeah. of people that perhaps didn't know what the final kilometer looked like messed up the final kilometer because I swear at least one rider that was in that group certainly could have potentially won this race if he knew the parkour better. We had Magnus Colt Nielsen going into the last 500 meters in first position. So he knows he must I need to be in this two. position to be in a good position to try and win the stage. Yeah, exactly. Laporte being in the wheel of Magnus Colt Nielsen, Dylan Turns being, I think, just in the wheel there as well or swinging around that wheel somewhere. Magnus Cote Nielsen taking every corner in first. He must know what is coming. And they went into the last corner. Laporte in second wheel. You would say Laporte, perfect position because he's in second wheel. But the finish line is in 30 meters. And yeah. I think Laporte was surprised. He tried to get past Magnus Cote Nielsen. But yeah, it, it won't work. There's just not enough time to do so. Magnus Cote Nielsen takes the final stage of Paris-Nice. I think... Just on parkour knowledge alone on the 500 meters, he was the strongest. And Laporte kind of messed up the rough thing because I swear Laporte could have won if he knew the parkour better. Once again, just like on stage six, Benji, Laporte not able to come out of the wheel when you think he would have been able to. But the top 10 on this stage, Magnus caught first for EF Education Nippo. He loves a reduced bunch, messy stage sprint like in the Vuelta last year. Laporte second, Latour third, Dylan turns fourth, Bargui fifth, Benji, the sprinter, Dylan Van Baal sixth, <laughs> Jon Izagira seventh, Jorgensen eighth, Lampard ninth, Schachmann tenth, in a group of about 21 riders, including Gino Maida. GC turned absolutely on its head. Schachmann wins Paris Nice the second year in a row. 19 seconds ahead of Vlasov and 23 seconds ahead of Yoni Zagira, two Astana Premier Tech riders on the podium on GC. Lucas Hamilton fourth, 40 back, as well as Tish Manute there as well in fifth. Then Guillaume Martin, Haig seventh, Jorgensen, Padapantra, and Gino Maida make up the top 10. Roglic ends up on GC coming 15th, two minutes and 16 behind. Maximilian Schachmann. So I said it in the preview, my video preview. Don't count out this final Paris stage. Crazy shit can happen. Marc Soler winning Paris in 2018 ahead of Simon Yates by four seconds. I tongue in cheek in my video that I put up this morning said, Oh, 52 second gap. Where have we seen that before going into the last stage? But I never <laughs> saw this coming, Benji. Because on strength, on strength, Astana and Bora couldn't have done anything to Roglic, even if he had no teammates. Like you saw the way Schachman was able to cover moves. There's no Roglic would have been able to do that as well. So um yeah, I mean, what are your thoughts on Roglic? And then we're gonna get into the inevitable debate in a second. 
This is a lot about Roglic that he first crashes. He apparently dislocated his shoulder in the first Jeez. crash, had to put that back and stepped on his bike and kept riding, which is insane. The source for that dislocation of the shoulder is cycling news. So take that with a grain of salt. They're usually pretty clickbaity. So sorry about that if it's wrong. But I've got the feeling that if you get on your bike with your wound on the left side, a wound on the right side, you crash another time in the last uh, corner of that descent, you get back on your bike, you start smashing it, you finish the stage, and what you do is you step off your bike, you go to Shockman, you say congratulations, fist bump, and you continue your day. That is Crazy. a fucking class act by Droglich because on paper, these other teams... Fuck them over. Let's be real. We're going to go into whether that's a good or a bad <laughs> thing in a second. But on paper, they fucked him over. And he, ga- he came to them and he said, congratulations, dude. I think that I think that is definitely Klaus. And he went up in my likable ranking because of it today. Genuinely. But um, let's yeah. talk about the elephant in the room. Okay, Should Bora and Astana have paced? <laughs> what is your take first? Well, first of all, I think there's a defense for them that they're acting on incomplete information. If the Yumbo Visma domestiques don't exactly know what's happened, Benji, then how are they supposed to know at the front of the race? How are they supposed to know yeah. if Roglic was just a, a part of a split? Because FDJ were part of that split. So maybe when the pace went up, he was just on the wrong side of a split. And, oh, yeah, it might have been affected by the crash. 70 k's 60 k's earlier but come on you you're still allowed to pace anyone would say at that point so obviously they've got incomplete information there b a race is a race we said Roglic was entitled to go for the stage win yesterday of course and um he crashed twice today it wasn't Bora Hansgrohe or Astana's fault to my knowledge that he crashed or that they caused him to crash I maintain this consistently since Movistar pacing in Vuelta 2019, a race to the race, crashing or not crashing is part of that race. Tony Martin and Rogler were the only guys to crash earlier in the race. Tony Martin not being there made a massive difference, Benji, as well. So, yeah, I don't, I think Astana and Bora did 100% the right thing. Just like Roglic has an obligation to his sponsors yesterday, Astana and Bora have an obligation to their sponsors to ride full and try and go for the win on the road. Uh, Do you have any different take? I've got a bunch of different takes. So (laughs) I want to call out a few people, not directly, but like a few types of people. First of all, the types of people that only complain in a situation like this, if their favorite rider of team is the rider that is behind because of a crash or a puncture and the other team start to pace. The person that complains then but not when it's a competitor. I want to call you out for hypocrisy there. That's a lot of people. I promise you. Then, secondly, the people who compare yesterday to today. So, you, Lantern. <laughs> I'm going to call you out there. <laughs> In the situation that yesterday is a racing situation where a rider is strong enough to win a race. So, he has the ability to win the race and is allowed to win the race if he wants to. And there's been a lot of shit on social media about it. but. I still stand by the point that Roglic is doing his job by winning that race. Today, Shockman is also in doing that, but the different situation is that Mater didn't fall twice yesterday. <laughs> I think there's a moral difference there. But despite all that, I believe that my take on this is that let's say that a GC competitor crashes in a 200 kilometer flat stage after uh, a good 80 kilometers, still 120 kilometers of flat stage left, and your competitor crashes in the yellow jersey, I'd be like, yeah, we'll wait, because it's a stupid stage to start pacing now, and it's also kind of a dick move to do it. Now, in a race where the situation is where we either have a race that is ongoing, like today, or a race that is about to explode, you have the complete allowance to, to keep racing. It's just... It's a race. It's a bike race. They can do whatever they want because at that point you're in a situation where the race is ongoing and they shouldn't stop racing because someone else crashed. I I don't believe that's a valid take. This is because of all the traditional 
unwritten rules that was uh, that were named in the past, those were unwritten rules are done for. Um, we had you just a huge debacle about it in the Contador versus two hundred k transition stage. You shouldn't pace eighty k's in. No, I wouldn't stay. I wouldn't pace. There is a difference okay. there. If someone else would pace, I would not complain, but I'd find it pretty stupid to start pacing on a one or two hundred kilometer flat part against the competitor that crashed. That's just my personal opinion on that. But I think the clear difference is here. In any racing situation that influences the race and such. And if you, for example, are planning to attack or whatever, or even if you weren't planning to attack, if it's in a situation that could change the race significantly, you're allowed to do it. The unwritten rules have passed for years now. And if you look at all the teams, at least somebody on those teams did it before. Last year, Roglic kept on pacing when Port had a puncture on Glier. Sure, he had to pace to stay with Pogacar and such, but those guys also paced, so they were all guilty somewhat to Richie Port, who was behind. So, yeah, there's a lot of situations where this has all happened to freaking everybody in the entire peloton. Pavade lost the Vuelta because someone else started pacing when he had a crash or puncture a few years ago. I think the Purito days. And then they were complaining when Valverde was doing it to Roglic in the Vuelta of 2019. Like, yeah, it's, it's unfair to Valverde in that situation, for example. No one paced when Roglic crashed, apparently, at the start of the stage. So like Benji said, yep. at the start of the stage, Jumbo Wiesner apparently went to the front of the peloton, blocked, and no one paced because, you know, Sharkman and co. weren't really interested at that point. But um, Sharkman and Astana might have been trying something in the last 20Ks. Hey, it's their last 20Ks of the Paris-Nice, trying to put Roglic under pressure, and his team might crumble. And his team weren't able to help him today, really, in the, after the second crash. Now, he sounded pretty banged up after that first crash, Benji. I'm yeah. going to go out on a limb and say that was a contributing factor to him crashing the second time. Uh, the reason I brought it up yesterday was because the logic... I mean, I didn't even know why people were criticizing it because I didn't grow up with cycling. So the unwritten rules, I've never, I've never even heard them let alone read them because you can't read them because they don't exist on paper. <laughs> um, but I didn't even know why there was a problem yesterday because I was like, it's a race. You're allowed to race whatever way you want as long as you're not endangering people. So yesterday's a race. Today's a race. Congrats to Sharkman. He stayed upright for the entirety of Paris-Nice. That's part of stage racing. CC, Richie Port, Geraint Thomas, Tay Gagenhart. And listen... I also think Ineos get better tires. Why did Gegenhardt's front wheel wash out, Benji? What if other teams are using better tires? No, like, but this is where equipment choices yeah, matter apparently for a TT. But then if anyone crashes because they're running maybe really quick tires or tires that don't have good grip or whatever, well, then you've got to wait for them. Or what if their handling's not so good? And, I mean, Sharkman crashed last year, Benji, <laughs> and Igita didn't wait for him in the last three kilometers, I don't think. So um, I think the, the easiest and fairest solution is to everyone just race full, and then it'll, that'll be the most just situation rather than, oh, well, he'll pay me back, and then now they don't like them, and then no, no, no. It never evens out in the wash like that, not, th- not in my view. Um, but yeah, anything else you've seen? You said exactly. you had a few rants, Benji. Yeah, another rant towards that. Like an extra point I want to I wanna bring up is the people that came up today and in the race were like, oh, they're all pacing against him. The entire peloton is pacing against Roglic because yesterday he was no. so, so greedy and took the victory from, from Mater. That, that's bullshit. Come on. It's, yesterday it's racing. Nothing. This is a tactic. Race tactic exists. And yesterday, indeed, changed nothing. I think the people that had that feeling or have that thought process should buy some kind of guide cycling tactics for dummies or something because I really don't get it. Fabio Aru, why is he pacing in the middle of the Bora train for Quebec Assos? He's training for the Tour de France, mate. That's clear. Like, <laughs> he's, he's of his leader. <laughs> we just don't know. <laughs> but sorry, go on. Yeah, I think... The comparison that we made yesterday, we said a lot about it already on social media. It's been pure mayhem. 
Um, but I think that another example is, let's say Roglic yesterday doesn't take the stage and he sits in the wheel of Mater, then Shockman most likely wins the stage because it was basically just behind Mater anyway. So yeah, that situation wouldn't really happen. But then Mater would say like, yeah, this is a gift by Roglic. So perhaps he might pay it back in the future. But let's say Roglic just stays with Shockman and doesn't make that move to Mater. Then Mater will never know that it was a gift. <laughs> Roglic will never get it paid back. And the people that are complaining that he made that final move won't have thought wouldn't about that because, well, yeah, they wouldn't it's not a him. gift because Mater won the race fairly. It's like it's Godou, like you... last year of Vuelta. Yeah. The reason yeah. Godou won that stage on Farapona was because Roglic opened up the gap or let the gap open up because he didn't care about the stage. He could have easily won that stage. We know it. We know he would have won that stage if he tried. He probably but should have, to be honest. He didn't. He didn't go for it. And Godou, yeah, he should have done it. Uh, that's our opinion. But and Godou <laughs> took that victory. I haven't heard anybody say that Godou got after that victory ever. And Godou never paid that back and will never pay that back to Roglic. Apparently, Roglic last few stage races, Paranis crashes twice, comes out of the top 10 on GC after absolutely like the most dominant. Seven days before in a stage race, different level from the other guys, crashes out of GC. Vuelta nearly cracks on the last stage, only needs... Who was pacing him? Movistar. Movistar were pacing him back to Carapaz to save his Vuelta. <laughs> Tour de France, we know what happened on Planche de Belfi. Dauphiné, uh, he crashed out of Dauphiné. And what was the stage before that? Anyway, I can't remember, but it's not been, it's been really bad luck for him, Benji. Um, do you think there's a, am I making it up that his crashing seems more frequent than others? Are you ready to put him in the Port Thomas category or do you think it's just bad luck at this point? I think we've got a lot of situations where we notice that a certain amount of riders crash more than others and it's difficult to say whether it's because they're more important that we see them more or there's more attention to them when they crash. Because I don't know the difference there. And we never see the fucking crashes. Yeah, we, we don't know who else crashed. Like, Godou crashed today. We haven't heard about it uh, perhaps three times during the entire oh, really? day I've heard about it. So, Godou crashed roughly at the same moment that Roglic crashed at the start of the stage. He DNF'd. He's not in the race after this stage. Well, obviously, because... Paris Nice is over. <laughs> but um, yeah, yeah, nobody talks about that because Roglic is the higher person. So we don't know whether the other these other people also crash just as much. And then it's difficult to judge whether, whether it's him being not a good guy at steering, which I doubt because he seems to be a pretty, uh, a pretty nifty rider on the bike. No, I disagree. I disagree, Benji, strongly. Well, just... I think like handling wise, solo, absolutely fine, perfect. I think bunch anticipation, waiting for people to move, gaps opening up, maybe not as good. And I know he's banged up at this point, but one thing came out to me, or a couple of things. He was following De Klerk's wheel, not following the road on that descent, and just fo almost followed De Klerk off a ravine. Second was when he was passing the quick step group initially on the road. When he was trying to pass them, he nearly crashed because he almost rode into a rider and they he didn't like anticipate that they were moving along the line in a certain way. And the reason why I say maybe the crashing is not just bad luck is because a lot of his crashes are just him. So Vuelta 2019, not his fault. He got taken out. Not his fault. Gagenhart. That was just him, not Godu's fault at all. But Roglic, a lot of his crashes seem to be just him. The one with Tony Martin was just him and Tony Martin. The one today, the second one, was just him, although he's banged up. So I'm not definitively calling it, but it is something I would be thinking about, whereas Pagacha we saw, you know, we've seen previously in the wet and yada, yada, yada. Been riding a bike since he was three seems to not have these crash issues. Sagan famously never, never crashes. So, yeah, do you think I'm blowing that out of proportion, Benji? Or is it just something you're, you're just going to monitor? No, I think I'm going to monitor it. I think that you're pretty uh, 
yeah, you, you're obviously good when it comes to the facts of these because this all happened the way you say it does. And obviously that's one of the conclusions you can definitely take out of this. I think one of the other conclusions is that we're still at the standpoint where I believe that Yumbo is very bad at adapting to situations. And I think that's perhaps a bit of a DS issue at this point. Not necessarily that they're bad DSs, but that they sometimes don't quickly adapt to a situation that is going on. We saw it in the Giro stage uh, where he crashed in uh, the descent of that Chiviglio in 20, uh, I don't know, 17, 2018. We saw uh, during, I think we saw during the last Felt, of course, the jacket issue. No, yeah, the reactions of the DS to that felt a bit like late. We obviously don't know what's happening inside the car, but from the outside perspective, this is what I never get transparency afterwards. Exactly. And today, kind of exactly the same situation, because if you ride a crash in the last corner, you're going to know somehow he's likely going to say it on his on his microphone. Perhaps Roglic didn't say it quickly enough because he was in all the chaos, getting on his bike, trying I mean, to get his, to the front dude, again. His shoulder might have been fucked and he could yeah. have pressed the thing. Yeah, the dislocation was in the first crash, not the second one, just to be sure. He, uh, his chain was off, though, in the I second know, crash. I know, but his shoulder would still be sore. Yeah, you're right. So, um, yeah, the reaction from the DS to, like, do something, the fact that Roglic has to pay two minutes and a half ahead of a group alone before anybody from the first group goes back to him, it's just all so weird that it all goes so slow. And I think Ineos is so much better prepared on any crash and stuff and anything happening to their riders to quickly react to it. And I think they train on it as well. UAE Tour, when that crash, when Adam Yates went down go and i want someone to get a stopwatch out go to my video watch it luke rowe throws his bid on straight up he throws it out and he's within two seconds on the radio with the end like it's just instantaneous he goes into that mode and now whether even if assuming giving them the benefit of the doubt that team radios weren't working whatever they still don't get a pass because if you're Kreisweik or Bennett or Uman, whoever it was at the front group, and Primoz isn't in your bubble, what you know what's going on? That should be alarm bells ringing, and you should one of you at least should be dropping back ASAP. So whether that would have made a difference if Roglic got back into that first group, I think it would have. I think if they bridged him quickly into that first group, Benji then Bora probably knock it off. And then Astana and Bora just attack each other in the last eight Ks, trying to get onto second on GC uh, or Tish Benoud, et cetera. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a real shame for Roglic. And I hope he comes back in Basque country. He'll come back strong. He showed again that he should be a Tour de France favorite. I joined up there with Pogaccia. Um Doesn't really change my opinion in that respect too much but yeah any last thoughts on this Paranese stage eight benji crazy stage crazy stuff i think that coming out of this Paranese, shockman is likely happy about winning it he's gonna feel a bit meh about the situation that he won because the roglic crashed but i think that the roglic is gonna come out of this first of all with trying to lick his wounds but also with the feeling that he absolutely destroyed everybody and he's looking very good for the next upcoming races so I think it's a win for Yambo despite not winning. The um the moral winner here, I'm not saying moral as in, oh, he's a good person of a, or a bad person. I think the moral winner from the perspective of uh I think that I'm the winner here because like I'm the performance like winner is Roglic because he knows he destroyed everybody and he's gonna go to the next couple of races with ludicrously stronger than everyone else. Yeah. So uh yeah, Roglic probably pretty happy about how the Sparanese went, despite the outcome not being the optimal one. I don't think he'll care too much that he lost Sparanese. It's only Sparanese. I think that, yeah, other races are more important, definitely to him. And he's going to step up at the start of the Tour de if France there's anyone that can, as one of the two favorites. If there's anyone that can lick his wounds and come back and not you know, compartmentalize a bad result. It's Primoz Roglic. He proved that last year after the Tour de France, which was much more devastating than this Paris-Nice uh, by far. So he's got maybe the strongest mental ability to just look past 
negative things that I've ever seen in an athlete. It's crazy, his ability to do that. Even by the time he got to the finish, he seemed to have accepted it. And as Benji said at the top of the show, fist bumping Shackman. So, yeah, I can't wait to see him later in the season. There's still some question marks, though, about team composition, etc., uh, for Yumbo Visma, but his legs look fantastic. Congrats to Max Shackman. Really happy for him. Seems like a funny and nice guy. And he acknowledged Benji even before Sage Seven in an interview. He's like, "Yeah, I mean, we could try, but <laughs> what are we going to do yeah. <laughs> against Roglic today, <laughs> anyway?" So, I mean, we all know who was the strongest across this last week. This was our Parony Stage 8 recap. Make sure you let us know in the comments on the YouTube video or on Twitter what you think about, um, yeah, Bora pacing the stage overall. Roglic, I'm sure a lot of you have some pretty some pretty hot takes about the whole thing. If you want to check out our show partner, LaCole, their link is in the description uh, if you want to check out the best performance cycling apparel out there. 